good afternoon to this week's uh, DIPC seminar. So it's uh, for me a first after the Corona break to uh, host a seminar again. I'm very glad that uh, Martin Zippenfeld is visiting us. He's a researcher at um, Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Garching. And um, he's, he studied in uh, the GU Munich and did his diploma and his PhD work there on um, trapping and cooling uh, molecules. And uh, since uh, many years, he's uh, leading a, uh, a group in the division of Gerhard Rempe at the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics uh, on ultra cold uh, molecules. And he'll give a talk today uh, titled Ultra Cold Polyatomic Molecules, a Quantum Toolbox for Fundamental Investigations. And so we're looking forward to your presentation. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Giza, thank, you. thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I dive right in. Uh, so switch to the screen. Uh, so here is an outline of my talk, what I'd like to talk to you uh, about today. So uh, starting with an introduction, um, in particular, focus a little bit on the various applications of cold and ultra cold uh, molecules. Um, then kind of the central part of my talk will be to present uh, the toolbox of techniques which we've developed over the years to uh, produce uh, cold, older cold ensembles of, of polyatomic polar molecules, um, in particular, including our cryofuge technique, combination of buffer gas cooling and centrifuge deceleration, um, presenting our microstructured electric trap, and, and also our optoelectrical Sisyphus cooling technique uh, to produce uh, molecules at, at sub millikelvin temperatures. Um, finally, in the last part of my talk, I want to talk about some of the applications we're now heading towards, um, in particular, our recent demonstration of precision spectroscopy of formaldehyde, um, the, the newest project I'm working on, uh, investigation of cold molecule Rydberg atom interactions, um, and, and also uh, um, discuss a little bit some of the future prospects where um, my kind of I envision this work to be heading in the future. Um, so uh, kind of a, a the question one can ask is, is why work with older cold uh, molecules, maybe also especially given the big success uh, working uh, for work with older cold atoms. Um, there's actually a famous quote from Arthur Shavlov, a diatomic molecule is an uh, atom with one atom to many. Um, so actually we have a, a kind of unique approach to dealing with this, this issue, which is to actually work with even larger molecules with um, uh, a, a larger number of atoms and uh, so what's generally interesting about molecules is, is first you have a much richer energy level structure than for atoms. So uh, in particular addition of rotational and uh, um, vibrational nuclear degrees of freedom um, and also a, a strong permanent electric dipole moment in the, in, the, uh, in the molecule frame, which leads to very strong interactions with electric field, a, a variety of very long lived states and long range dipole dipole interactions and this is kind of the foundation to do lots of really fascinating quantum physics with, pol uh, with polar molecules. So there's uh, kind of four main applications which I want to go through step by step, uh, cold chemistry, precision measurements, uh, quantum antibody physics and quantum computation. And so for uh, cold and ultra cold collisions and chemistry, there's, there's kind of four um, kind of big goals I've, I've, I, I would identify. One is very interesting aspect is achieving full quantum control over chemical reactions. So basically, I mean, if, if you think about uh, uh, chemical reactions at, 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 at room temperature, higher temperatures, I mean, typically it's, it's a extremely complicated process with, with not really accountable number of quantum, uh, quantum channels involved. Whereas in, an, in a very low temperature regime, one can have kind of a physicist's dream of a chemical reaction where one has total control over, over all quantum degrees of freedom, um, including motion and, and internal degrees of freedom. Um, and, and this can, for example, then uh, lead to comparisons with Abinicio uh, theory and, and allow uh, new insights in this direction. Um, then another very interesting aspect of collisions at low temperatures is the ability to perform field controlled collisions at chemistry. Um, so basically using electric or magnetic, also maybe optical or microwave fields to, to uh, influence chemical reactions or, or collisions. Um, and, and this really becomes possible roughly in a, in a Kelvin temperature range and low because at that point the uh, field interactions with, with fields which can be produced in a laboratory become comparable to uh, kinetic energy of the molecules. 
Then uh, a third area is, is looking at collision resonances, uh, collision complexes. Um, so uh, with, a, with a sufficient uh, energy resolution, um, kind of in the same way as, as is the case for atoms, one gets uh, collision resonances and, and can basically in, investigate the, the intermediate um, complexes in, in this manner. And a, a final important aspect of, of uh, cold chemistry is it's also a, a basic prerequisite for further cooling of molecules towards quantum degeneracy, um, where, where interactions between the molecules become very important. And I just wanna highlight uh, one example uh, from 2012, which uh, where uh, the group of Edna Rizius were uh, basically developed a merged beam techniques and were the first in, in this manner to um, have a sub, uh, sub Kelvin resolution uh, on, on a collision between uh, hydrogen molecules and, and metastable helium. And were basically able to observe uh, collision resonances for this process. Um, and, and that's kind of a, you know, a, a first step really showing kind of the potential in, in this direction. Um, and then the second area of investigation is, is tests of fundamental physics. Um, so basically using molecules to test fundamental theories. And this includes, for example, parity violation, uh, time reversal symmetry, um, it, it, testing for time variation of fundamental constants and or, or dark matter searches. Um, and certainly one of the probably one of the most famous examples of this is, is the search for a possible electric dipole moment of the electron, where since 2011, the most precise limit uh, on the electric dipole moment of the, of the electron is, is based on measurements using molecules, uh, which has been by now even improved by uh, almost uh, two orders of magnitude. Um, and it, basically with this type of experiment, it, it's ruling out um, the parameter regimes, which are basically entirely inaccessible by uh, high energy experiments, for example, at CERN. So basically performing high tera electron volt uh, physics with tabletop experiments. Um, so I, one very interesting aspect is also to ask the question, why are, are molecules particularly interesting for this? And this kind of uh, two reasons I would give. And, and the first is that molecules basically uh, constitute uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. So in particular for, um, for example, the EDM experiments, uh, a key aspect is you want, uh, basically the signal one obtains is proportional to sp orbital hybridization inside an atom or molecule. And whereas obtaining sp hybridization in an atom is, is very difficult, uh, typically requires to apply very high fields to get a small signals. Um, in a molecule, this is basically given for free uh, because the molecule itself kind of breaks rotation uh, rotational symmetry in, in, in the molecule frame of reference. Um, and, and the second aspect would then also, a similar aspect is chirality. So of course molecules can exhibit chirality, which also then breaks inversion symmetry um, and, and thereby allows uh, um, a parity violation to be investigated. Um, a, a second key point is that uh, nuclear dynamics dominates for vibration and rotation of molecules. So this is particularly relevant, for example, if, if you want to look at the uh, uh, electron uh, to proton mass ratios, because in an atom, the dynamics is basically almost entirely given by uh, the mass of the electron and, and the nuclei play, plays a fairly small role. Um, and so uh, uh, this enables to uh, get much higher precision um, with, with molecules for such measurements. Um, so then a third main area of, of investigation is, is quantum many body physics. Um, and uh, of course, you know, there's great work, uh, just amazing work going on for the last decades uh, with, with uh, ultra cold atoms. Um, and the key aspect which molecules uh, contribute here is, is strong long range anisotropic interactions. And because if you, I mean, if you look at work on uh, cold atoms, it's, it's quite remarkable how many creative ideas people have come up with to engineer interactions between uh, the particles. I mean, typically you only have contact interactions, um, but also, I mean, people have been looking at, you, you know, coupling atoms to, to resonators or exciting them to Rydberg states to engineer interactions. Um, and, and actually a, a preview of, of some of the really exciting physics, which is possible with molecules actually comes from using uh, the much weaker magnetic dipole-dipole atoms in, um, in, in atoms. So uh, the group of Tilman Pau were able to observe um, uh, uh, quantum droplets of, of molecules where, where basically they saw 
uh, ag aggregates where, so if you, if you look at uh, the, the size of a freely expanding uh, Bose-Einstein constant is the red um, data here. And whereas for the droplets, you basically get no expansion because it's a self-bound system. Um, finally, the, the last area where molecules are quite interesting is, is for quantum computation. Um, I would say in some sense, this is the most audacious application of, of cold molecules simply because there are so many you know, very promising other systems uh, um, for, for working towards quantum information. So, so, so the question is, what, what do molecules have to contribute which, which might make them possible suitable candidates? And, and here, this is basically having uh, suitable states for encoding qubits, as well as very good um, opportunities for qubit manipulation. So in terms of states, this is particularly the rotational and vibrational states and, and just some uh, typical numbers. So typical vibrational transitions in molecules have transition wavelengths in the range three micrometer to 100 micrometer for reasonably sized molecules with uh, coherence times on the order of 10 milliseconds to too many seconds. And uh, for vibration, this is even lower frequencies and higher uh, frequencies. So really ideal uh, frequency range for coupling to other systems, including microwave or, or uh, also Rydberg atoms, which I'll be uh, getting to. Um, and then also very good opportunities for qubit manipulation. So uh, especially via the uh, permanent electric dipole moment in, in the molecule frame, uh, you get very strong dipole-dipole interactions. So, so roughly a one kilohertz interaction energy for a one micrometer molecule molecule separation as well as very strong coupling to microwaves. So roughly a one megahertz interaction energy for a single molecule for an electric field of, of one volt per centimeter, which is of course a fairly low electric field uh, for many situations. Um, and I, I just wanna highlight three uh, proposals, uh, specific environments which people have envisioned uh, to, to realize quantum computation with polar molecules. Um, the first being a proposal by David DeMille from 2002, which is just having a linear chain of molecules um, for example, having a, a capacitor plates with a spatially varying electric field to allow single qubit addressability, and then having a dipole-dipole interactions between uh, molecules to, to uh, en enable uh, entanglement and, and so on. Um, and the second promising more kind of set of techniques is to couple molecules to other types of, of, of uh, quantum information platforms, for example, uh, coupling molecules to superconducting qubits. Um, there is a very well-known uh, proposal on this by Andrea from 2006. Um, and, and also kind of a third uh, proposal, which um, is, is basically to just use the huge amount of internal degrees of freedom of a molecule. So there's actually a proposal uh, from Tesh and uh, from 2002 of, of just using the, you know, using a large molecule and, and just using the various uh, vibrational degrees of freedom um, as, as a, a single molecule quantum computer. Um, and, and certainly adaptations of this idea are, are very, very powerful. Um, okay, so, so with that kind of overview, I, I uh, kind of, you know, you have a very strong motivation for, for dealing with uh, uh, working with cold, cold, cold molecules. Um, and, and now the, the real challenge is, well, how do you get there experimentally? And, and so in this framework, I'd like to present a kind of our, our toolbox of techniques um, and kind of the, the most basic technique we're using in our group is, is manipulating polar molecules with electrostatic fields. So, so this is a, a big advantage of molecules that you have this uh, a dipole moment in, in the molecule frame. So, so this is a typical energy level diagram. You have various rotational states at, at zero electric field. Um, and if you apply an electric field, you get uh, you know, energy shifts and in particular some states which, which reduce energy in electric field um, but are of particular usefulness are our so-called low field seeking states which increase their energy uh, for a higher electric field. Um, and this means that it's very easy to trap this kind of, of states. Uh, for example, using just a quadrupole configuration with four electrodes, kind of as shown here also, um, by applying alternate DC voltages, uh, you get an electric field zero at the center and, and uh, from the center linearly increasing fields towards the outside, which is then a, a two-dimensional trapping potential for uh, polar molecules. Um, and, and we use this kind of as our, our most basic uh, source and also of, of polar molecules um, by basically adding just a, an effusive source of molecules. So, so basically a source of molecules where there's molecules streaming out, um, ideally with the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And in this case, there's always a, a small fraction of molecules with, with very low energy. And uh, these trapping fields, they can find molecules with a, a transverse kinetic energy of, of up to 
uh, about a Kelvin of, of kinetic energy. Um, and, and so basically you filter out the small, uh, the lowest energy on, uh, molecules from a, a thermal ensemble, uh, which is actually a very uh, useful source of molecules. So it gives you a continuous source, um, uh, even, even though the, the fraction of molecules is, is uh, being guided is fairly small. Um, simply due to the fact that, uh, I, I mean, for example, at, you know, at, at, at one atmosphere of pressure, you have typically around, uh, you have 10 to the 19 molecules per cubic centimeter, roughly. So, uh, I mean, 10 to the minus four of this is, is still a huge number of molecules. Um, and, uh, and, and then the final advantage is also, it's a very robust source of molecules. Um, this advantage in this case are, the molecules are still rough, uh, relatively warm. Uh, so temperatures are on the order of one Kelvin, and, and certainly I'm going to be presenting ideas for how to uh, get substantially better results, and, and also no internal state cooling. Although in particular for very uh, fairly light molecules we're using with these types of sources, this, this really isn't a, a particularly big problem. Um, however, one uh, method we use to address these problems is, is buffer gas cooling. Um, so, uh, based on ideas from the uh, Doyle group at Harvard in, in, in 2009, we demonstrated uh, extraction of, of molecules from a, a buffer gas cell using an electrostatic guide. Um, and, and basically, the two key advantages are that, for one, the buffer gas source reduces the kinetic energy of the molecules, which means you just have a much larger uh, fraction of molecules which you can use for, for subsequent experiments. Um, and, and also, in, in the process, you get internal state cooling. Um, the, the one big disadvantage of buffer gas sources, which basically faces all, all groups using this technique, is, is you end up with beams typically with fairly high forward velocities. Um, and, and this is simply due to the fact you, you need a certain amount of, of, of helium buffer gas inside such a cell uh, to achieve a, a, a collisional cooling with the molecules. Uh, but these collisions uh, continue to process, persist as molecules are leaving the buffer gas cell. And this always leads to some amount of forward acceleration of the molecules. So typically um, on the order of 50 meters per second or more, which means uh, it's, it's then no, no longer possible to trap these molecules in three dimensions directly. Um, and so we spend quite some time thinking about solutions for this problem. And um, basically we'd like to decelerate the beams. And, and a key goal we had in these experiments is to decelerate these beams continuously while preserving the high flux. Um, and I mean, really, almost all deceleration methods which have been developed elsewhere work in, in pulsed mode, where, where you're taking individual packets of, uh, of, of molecules and, and, and only de um, decelerating them as, as a packet. Um, and, and there's actually one very simple approach to uh, dealing with this, which would be to simply use gravitation. So, so shooting up the molecules. So if you have a, a beam of molecules with a, a 100 meter per second forward velocity, you would need about a 500 meters vertical distance to decelerate them. Um, especially, I mean, just outside of Munich, we have the Alps. So in principle, this would be technically possible. Um, although even with, with a pretty uh, awesome funding situation at, at MDQ, you know, this is still a, maybe a little bit too expensive to just realize uh, without considering alternatives. Um, so uh, one possibility actually, uh, which maybe sounds like science fiction at first is to enhance gravity. Um, but of course this is very, uh, you know, this is very straightforward because you can simply enhance gravity effectively using a centrifugal uh, potential. Uh, basically having, a, 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 for example, a, a highly rotating disc, having a source at the edge of the disc and then um, transferring the molecules to the center. Um, the problem is for this to work, you need the edge of to, the disk to be rotating at the velocity of the, uh, of, the, of the molecules, which, so for 100 meters per second, the outside of the disk needs to be moving at 100 meters per second. I mean, this is certainly technically possible, but putting a buffer gas source on a, on a wheel rotating at 100 meters per second, it does seem a bit crazy. Um, and so, so the second key idea to get this to work is a, is a technique to continuously transfer molecules from a, a stationary quadrupole electric guide onto a spinning disk. And so the idea here is to have the following electrodes. This is always two electrodes on top of each other. So here we have a, a total of four electrodes forming a quadrupole guide. And to have these electrodes uh, stationary in the lab frame and add these electrodes in a rotating manner. And what you can see is that here molecules can basically most of the time be transferred from the uh, lab fixed frame to a half moving frame. And then basically if the molecules are, are moving at precisely twice the speed of the rotating disc, then eventually they catch up to this pickup 
and then uh, enter the fully rotating guide and our guide to the center. And, and again, at twice, if, if the molecule bus is twice the rotation speed at the outside, they end up at the center at, uh, at standstill. And so we actually realized this design, this is a couple pictures. So here's uh, kind of the, the mounted disks uh, showing, I think just the inside uh, two disks. Uh, so it's a total of, of, of five disks for, for, with four electrodes and, and kind of a, a mounting disk. Um, and, and so uh, with a 40 centimeter diameter and, and kind of you're showing the bend up into the center to extract the molecules on axis. Um, here's the injection region. Um, kind of a close up of the injection and, and, and this pickup electrode coming, coming by um, and, and also kind of a, a side total view of the, of the total setup. Um, and so uh, just some, so the very first signals we kind of had was, was already quite exciting to simply rotate the centrifuge by hand, apply uh, voltages to the, um, uh, to the electrodes. And, and what you can see is, is you basically get a region. Uh, so this is basically background level of molecules and that you get an increase in signal when the uh, electrodes, so there's basically a, a small fraction of the, of, the, uh, of, of the rotation angle. So basically if, if this part of the rotation is facing the quadruple guide, then molecules cannot uh, enter the, the, the centrifuge. Whereas for the entire rest of the rotation period, um, you, you get a continuous flux of molecules. And so you can also see this then by rotating the centrifuge very slowly uh, as a function of, of, of rotation phase, you get the black curve at, at very low speeds. Um, and, and then as you, you speed up, what you can actually see is, is that going from a, a beam where, where there's molecules coming roughly two thirds of the time, you actually end up with a, 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 an output where molecules are ex exiting uh, basically continuously, um, simply because uh, one of the main effects is also molecules are spreading out um, and, and um, there's also some details about the physics of, of entering a, a rotating frame. Um, and what was also really, really surprising for us is that, uh, I mean, we were expecting the molecule signal to remain roughly at this level, but the signal actually increases as you increase the rotation speed. And this is simply the fact that at low rotation speed, molecules initially have to be slow enough that they're able to uh, stay trapped with this 20 centimeter a bend radius, but at the end we have a five centimeter bend radius, and and this five centimeter bend radius limits fast molecules from exiting the centrifuge. Um, however, once we rotate the centrifuge, um, molecules are decelerated before they they reach this five centimeter bend radius, which means that actually a larger fraction of molecules entering the centrifuge uh, can persist to the outside. Um, right, so we've we've combined this uh, setup with with the cryo uh, with the cryo source as well. So th so the first experiments were performed with a velocity filtering source, and and this is kind of then the the, the the entire setup. So we have the buffer gas source, and the um, and and here's the centrifuge, um, and uh, it's 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 just really quite amazing. Just you just get very high brightness sources of of, of cold molecules, um, and so so now the Basically, with this initial setup, we simply had a beam of molecules uh, going out of the centrifuge. Uh, but the, uh, a key next step then is to really provide three-dimensional trapping uh, for the molecules. Um, and, and for this, uh, you can kind of ask, well, so, so what, what do you want to trap an, an ideal molecule trap to look like? And, and we actually had some rather somewhat unique criteria for, for our experiments. Um, and, and the first criteria is pretty obvious. You, you ideally want a long le trap lifetime to, to achieve, you know, to have time to do various experiments. Um, but then uh, kind of the most specific requirement is we, we'd like to be able to continuously load molecules from a quadruple guide. Uh, because, I mean, we have a continuous source of molecules. So, so having a trap where you, you can just uh, trap molecules kind of from an instance, uh, basically you end up throwing, throwing away a huge, uh, um, a uh, fraction of the molecules, if, if you can only like briefly open the trap and then and, and briefly close it, um, you, you end up throwing away most of your molecules. Um, and a, a third requirement we actually had is to have a, a trap with homogeneous electric fields. Um, and, and this sounds maybe like a complete contradiction, but before I go into how we do this, uh, just the, the reasoning behind this, I mean, we have molecules at a kinetic energy of roughly one Kelvin, which leads to start broadening of, of roughly on the order of 10 gigahertz. And in addition to diluting any kind of transitions one would want to drive between molecular states, um, this is also uh, problematic if you want to do any kind of selective addressing between various M sublevels. 
Um, so how do we go about doing this? And, and the key idea is to trap molecules between a pair of microstructure electric mirrors, basically. So if you have a pair of capacitor plates and on the surface of the capacitor plate, you have a series of, of strip electrodes um, and, and you basically apply alternating voltages to these uh, electrode strips. Um, then you end up with, with high electric field near the surface, which decay exponentially towards the center of the trap, um, which means you get strong electric field at the edge, but you can basically get two nipple homogeneous fields in the center. And by now applying an additional ring electrode around the perimeter of the trap, you end up with full 3D confinement. Uh, moreover, by interrupting this perimeter electrode, um, you can uh, basically continuously load molecules from the quadruple guide. Um, and now a key feature of this trap is, is it's, it's kind of like, like a bathtub in the sense that you have a, a large volume and only a small hole. So, I mean, if you fill water into your bathtub and, and pull the plug, then it's gonna, you know, it's gonna take a quite a long time for the water to leave the bathtub. And in the same way, uh, the trapping principle works here that molecules actually take quite a long time to find this exit um, leading to long trap lifetimes, even for very high energy molecules. Um, so, so this is how the uh, trap is integrated into the uh, experiment in, in the first experiments where we, uh, um, where we, we, we use this trap. Uh, we actually ha have a second version now also attached to the cryofuge experiment. So in this sense, in case we had a, just an effusive velocity filtered source of molecules, um, then the trap, and then a second guide to unload the molecules for detection with a quadruple mass spectrometer. And a, a typical experiment might look now as follows. We, we switch on the trap and the guide and you get some molecules leaking through to the mask, uh, to the quadrupole. Uh, and, and then we switch off the initial guide and, and basically wait for some time. Um, and in this case, after a total of 16 seconds, we, we reapply voltages to the final guide and, and get a, a signal of molecules coming out of the trap. Um, and we can actually do this for, for various holding times um, and uh, even for, for just uh, direct molecules coming from the source without addi any additional cooling, um, we ended up with trap lifetimes on the order of 10 seconds. Um, yeah, which is, is pretty awesome for, for future experiments. So um, uh, trap lifetimes on the order of, of, of up to 10 seconds or so and, and molecules even stored for 60 seconds. Um, for additional cooling, we were actually able to even get a uh, trap lifetimes of up to a minute um, and, and see uh, really molecules on, on minute time scales. Um, then the, the final key aspect of the trap is, of course, the, the electric field distribution inside the trap. Uh, so this is a simulation of electric fields and, and on a logarithmic scale. And you can really see nicely how you get these very strong fields around the outside of the trap, but then this fairly uh, homogeneous region, field region in the center. Um, and in particular, based on the simulation, we can calculate uh, electric field distributions. Um, and, and so this is the red line. And, and now the blue data is, is based on, on, on measurements of, of basically doing spectroscopy of a line and looking at stark broadening. And, and this allows a direct comparison between, um, uh, um, between the simulation and, and experiment. And, and you basically get a, a, a curves which match reasonably well. Um, and, and really proves this concept of having a trap with, with homogeneous fields in, in a large region of the trap. Okay, so, so based on this, it's, it's kind of then the, the final key challenge is, is to uh, get to, to even lower temperatures. Um, and um, I mean, if you just look, think in general how to, to cool an object, uh, cooling really has two distinct aspects. And, and the one is um, having a, a, a dissipative process. If you, if you really want to remove ent uh, entropy from an ensemble, you need some kind of dissipation. And um, here, a, a key problem is that, that the majority of molecules people work with, um, you, you don't have closed electronic transitions. So, so no closed optical cycle change transitions, um, which are, are so useful for laser cooling um, atoms. I mean, obviously there's exceptions. There's been exceptional work done on laser cooling of, of um, of, of molecules like calcium fluoride or, or um, uh, strontium fluoride, similar molecules with, with some very specific properties. Um, so, so our idea was to use vibrational spontaneous decay. And, and here the problem is that, that this is a fairly slow process. So, so for the second process, reduction in energy, I mean, the, the, the typical process used for, for um, laser cooling of atoms is photon recoil. And at some point we realized the problem with photon recall, it's, it's really a very inefficient way to make use of, of your spontaneous decay. Um, so, so then the question is, can you replace photon recall for reducing the energy of, of a molecule with something a little bit stronger? 
Um, and here the key point, the, 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 the ideal method is to use, use electric field interactions to reduce the energy of the molecules. So, so basically using a type of Sisyphus scheme. So, so the idea is to have a pair of molecular states um, which uh, have a different interaction between um, the molecules and a, an external electric field. So for example, using the, the two uh, most aligned, so the M equal three and, and the M equal uh, two level for a J equal three uh, rotational state. Um, the M equal three has a strong interaction with electric field and the M equal two level a weaker interaction. So if you now start with molecules in the M equal three state, they can move around in the trap just based on their kinetic energy. And if you now apply a, a radio frequency, which is resonant with the M equal three to M equal two transition at the edge of the trap, um, then the molecules can be uh, driven to the lower state and basically regain less kinetic energy as they move into the center of the trap. And, and then uh, the, the dissipative process is optical pumping via vibrational transition and, and thereby restart the process in, in a unidirectional matter in, in the original state. And a, a key final aspect is eventually the molecules no longer have enough kinetic energy to reach the edge of the trap. So then you reduce the radio frequency uh, for further cooling. Um, and, and to really uh, get a, a large degree of cooling, we ended up actually needing 20, 20 individual steps to, to cool uh, molecules down to very low temperatures. Um, and moreover, even had to then, uh, because we were basically approaching an, an energy where the, the great fraction of energy of the molecules is simply the potential energy due to the uh, homogeneous offset field. And, and so by um, uh, reducing the electric fields inside the trap in, in, in the end by over an order of magnitude, uh, you, you can go to lower and lower temperatures. And, and now a final challenge for really demonstrating that, that we were able to reach very low temperatures was uh, measuring the temperature of the molecules. And for this, we used an RF knife to, to scan the temperature distribution. So now again, basically applying this radio frequency uh, to uh, drive transition between different M sub levels. But instead of doing this with a fairly weak uh, field, we do it with a very strong field, which means molecules are not just transferred to M equal two, but also to lower M states and are basically lost in the trap. Um, however, only molecules with a sufficient energy to reach the uh, the point in field in the electric fields with, where the molecules are resonant will actually re be, be removed. And by scanning this frequency, we're basically act, act, uh, able to scan the integrated energy distribution. And doing this, we get the following results. Uh, so we have uh, basically depletion of molecules uh, already for um, electric for, for, for differences between the offset field and, and the, the, the knife field at, of, of just a few megahertz, which ends up corresponding to a median kinetic energy of, of, of around 400 microkelvin. Um, and this was really exciting for us because it was just a really big goal, which seemed almost unattainable for a long time to reach sub millikelvin temperatures. Um, so at the time, these were the uh, coldest directly cooled uh, polar molecules, uh, which was back to back with similar results from the group uh, of Dave DeMille at Yale with strontium fluoride. Um, we have a very high number of molecules actually up to today. This is the, the largest ensemble of, of uh, ultra cold molecules for any group worldwide. Um, and uh, in the process, we're reducing the temperature of the molecules by a factor of a thousand and, and increasing the phase space density of the molecules even by four orders of magnitude. And what's also pretty nice, it's, it's, it's really, from an experimental standpoint, it's really quite a simple experiment you know, with just using a, a single laser. So in comparison, there's actually experiments on, on associating molecules where I think there's like on the order of 40 or 50 separate laser beams going through the experiments. So it's, it's really, people have, you know, it's, it's really crazy to what effort uh, other groups go to, to also produce molecules at very low temperatures. Okay, so, so uh, that's kind of the, the, the overview of, of the techniques uh, we've developed. And, and so, I mean, just based on these great techniques, uh, we're kind of now refocusing more and more of, of, on applications of, of polar molecules. Um, and I wanna mention two in particular, uh, precision spectroscopy of formaldehyde and investigation of cold molecule Rydberg atom interactions. Um, and so in the, in the first case, um, I mean, if, if you want to do extremely uh, precise uh, trend, uh, spectroscopy on, on the same molecule, uh, a, a key a problem in the end is, well, you need the molecule to be around long enough so uh, uh, time energy uncertainty doesn't end up, uh, you know, leading to, to broadening. And, and of course, the longest time you can get is to trap the particles that you're looking at. 
Um, of course, the key problem that comes along with this is that the trapping fields cause broadening. And as I've mentioned previously, a uh, temperature of, of one Kelvin uh, corresponds to a, a, a frequency shift of, of 20 gigahertz. So, um, I mean, this obviously is not exactly precision spectroscopy. And uh, the solution to this is to, to combine uh, two of the techniques I've already shown, our homogeneous field electric uh, trap and the cooled mo molecules with uh, a third ingredient, which is to use a magic transition at a magic electric field. Um, as follows. So uh, again, uh, if you just have a generic transition, you're going to typically have gigahertz broadening uh, at, at, at um, moderate temperatures. Um, and, and due to the uh, homogeneous fields in a trap, this actually reduces to uh, on the order of 5, 10 megahertz or so. Uh, but now the uh, key idea is, is to use a pair of states where at some electric field, the uh, uh, two uh, states have exactly the same um, uh, this shift of the Stark sh uh, shift with electric field. So in, in formaldehyde, which we're using for this experiment, for example, we can use the transition from, from the rotational state JKM432 to 533. Um, and you get this differential Stark shift as a function of electric field. And you see that you have a minimum right at around just over one kilovolt per centimeter. Um, and what's also, also quite remarkable, I mean, here we're at a, at a megahertz electric, um, megahertz energy um, frequency scale. Here we're actually at a, at a 100 kilohertz interval for the energy scale. But in fact, the, the uh, common shift of these two states uh, at a field of one kilovolt per centimeter is, is 370 megahertz. So it's really a huge suppression in, in the slope of the uh, star shift with respect to electric field. And so this means that if we now in, uh, kind of uh, um, combine this with the electric field distribution in this trap, we end up with a, um, a, um, this, um, a, a width of the transition based on electric fields of, of actually less than 100 hertz. Um, so a reduction by many, many orders of magnitude. And, and based on this technique, um, this is now experimental uh, data for uh, actually molecules looking at the transition uh, with molecules at different temperature. And, and what you can see very clearly uh, is, is the, the line width of the molecule actually um, behaves quite proportionally to uh, the square root of the temperature, which, which precisely indicates that it's due to Doppler broadening. And we can actually get a quite accurate modeling of the line shape simply by making a simple module uh, model based on residual Stark broadening combined with Doppler broadening, which, which really describes our data extremely well. Um, and in this way, we get down to a relative line width of 10 to the minus eight at the lowest um, temperature ensemble. Um, and we're able to uh, uh, determine the center frequency of, of this transition uh, with a precision on, of, of roughly 10 to the minus 10. Um, so that's a, yeah, a, a pretty nice result. Um, then the uh, second application I would like to talk about is, is uh, combining molecules with Rydberg atoms. And uh, the key motivation of, of this project is, uh, I mean, it's, it's still somewhat of a challenge to really get the very high degree of control over, over pol polar molecules, which uh, exists for atoms. So is there some way to use the control which exists for uh, atoms and transfer this to molecules? And there's actually a, a similar system which demonstrates the power of this type of techniques, which is to combine molecular and atomic ions. Um, and basically using the Coulomb interaction uh, combined with quantum logic spectroscopy uh, to both cool the eternal, the, uh, the, the motional degrees of freedom, as well as recently also then to perform basically quantum logic gates between uh, a molecular ion and uh, an atomic ion. And if you think about doing similar experiments with neutral particles, um, a, a, a key way to do this is actually to combine molecules with Rydberg atoms. And there's a number of uh, proposals even in this direction for cooling molecular motion, for controlling elect, uh, internal molecular states, and, uh, and also for, for quantum information processing applications. Um, and so, it, I mean, this is just based on very strong dipole-dipole interactions between molecules and Rydberg atoms. 
And if you just plug in some typical numbers, so a typical molecular dipole moment might be, for example, one Debye, a typical Rydberg dipole moment might be 6,600 Debye. And in this case, for one micrometer separation, you end up with an interaction energy of one megahertz. So, I mean, this is really quite large and, and I mean, it, it scales with one over R cubed. So at 100 nanometers, you actually get a one gigahertz interaction energy for, for molecules. So, I mean, this is a very strong handle for, for um, uh, getting these systems to interact. Um, and I mean, the, the, the easiest way to do this, uh, which is also the basis for a, um, a proposal by Kutzen et al, is to simply place the molecule next to the Rydberg atom and, and detect the energy shift. Um, and the problem with this is you, you really need a high degree of control over both the Rydberg atom and the molecule to, to place them in a controlled manner within one micrometer with each other. Um, and a very powerful uh, alternative is to use, uh, uh, to basically enhance interactions using first resonant energy transfer. Um, so the idea in this case is to have a pair of molecular states, uh, for example, two different rotational states with some energy splitting, and now look for a pair of Rydberg states with exactly the same energy splitting. Um, and in this case, instead of a, 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 a static dipole-dipole uh, uh, interaction, you, you get energy exchange during a collision. So for example, if the molecule sta starts in the state J plus one, uh, the higher energy state, the, uh, the Rydberg atom starts in the state R1, the lower energy state, um, then as the molecules uh, and the Rydberg atom pass, the, the energy can be transferred uh, to the Rydberg atom. Um, and, and this is very powerful for two reasons. Uh, for, for one, um, it's, it's a resonant process. Uh, so it allows you to uh, basically discriminate from other type of processes. And, and what's even more powerful is the basically interaction in some sense persists even after they fly apart, simply because there's a state change taking place. Um, so you're not just looking for some kind of phase shifts caused by an interaction, but you actually end up in a completely different state, which makes it very easy to, to, to look for uh, this process taking place. Um, and, uh, and we looked at this in some preliminary experiments at room temperature. So the idea is to use a pulse style laser, um, have a vacuum cell with a, a, a pair of capacitor plates in the center and shoot uh, through the capacitor plates uh, with a 300 nanometer laser to do a single photon excitation of rubidium Rydberg atoms, um, and then add uh, molecules and, and, and then to detect the state change, a very powerful technique is state selective field ionization, um, basically applying a voltage ramp to, to rip away the electron um, and the voltage at which the electron uh, gets removed from the Rydberg atom uh, depends on the state of the Rydberg atom. And this way you can discriminate the different states. So the basic level scheme to, to investigate this process, so you have a single photon excitation to a Rydberg state in rubidium. And in this case, we choose the 46P state. Um, the reason for doing this is that it's, it's roughly 24 gigahertz away from the 45D state, which is uh, resonant with the uh, well-known inversion uh, uh, transition in, in ammonia. Um, so if you have ammonia in the system, you, you expect basically the, the ammonia to cause transitions to the 45D state. Um, and then the final process is to have a resonant uh, millimeter wave uh, radiation in the system um, to, to, uh, uh, to move the Rydberg atom to a more uh, uh, remote state. And, and the key advantage here is you simply get a much better resolution than using state selective field ionization. And so this is uh, field ionization signals uh, for, for various processes. So what's basically shown is the amount of uh, electrons detected with a uh, electron multiplier as a function of, uh, of, of time uh, during which this field wrap is happening. And so the blue curve shows the, um, the, the system with, 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 with just background, no, no ammonia in the system and, and, and the millimeter wave pulse um, on. And if you now add ammonia to the system, um, you can do two measurements with a millimeter wave pulse on and off, and you, and you see basically you, you get this additional peak uh, for, for earlier ionization times, meaning higher and uh, Rydberg state. So, so basically this corresponds to the 46P state and, and the 45D state is not particularly well distinguishable, but the 51P state is very well distinguishable and, and you basically get a signal here, which corresponds to the presence of the molecules. Um, so, so doing this at, at room temperatures is, is great to do some initial tests and, and actually one of the most exciting things to look at now is, I mean, this is a resonant process. So what you can do now is to, for, you can basically do two types of tests. 
Uh, for the first, you can, instead of using the 46p to 45d transition, you can use different uh, principal quantum numbers, um, basically doing n to n minus 1, np to n minus 1d transitions for different n. Um, but you can also tune the frequency of this transition using electric fields, um, because the, uh, ener the, the Rydberg atoms uh, change fairly violently their energy with, with electric fields. And so this allows you to basically look at the amount of straight transfer going on as a reduction, um, as a um, function of the transition frequency of the rubidium um, transition frequency. And you, you basically get a re low resolution spectrum of the um, ammonia, uh, of the inversion splitting in ammonia. So, so it's kind of crazy. You, you end up doing a spectroscopy of a molecule uh, using rubidium atoms instead of, of, of photons. Um, okay, so, so, so kind of the, the next big uh, goal here is to investigate uh, these types of interactions with, with cold molecules and, and, and Rydberg atoms. Um, and so specifically combine uh, cold molecules uh, produced by velocity filtering with ultra cold atoms from a magneto optical trap. And this is something I'm, I'm currently setting up. So, so this is kind of a technical drawing um, of, of the setup. Uh, a, a key challenge here, so we have this quadruple guide uh, which terminates in uh, as close to the mod as possible. So, so a key challenge is to really uh, have the end of this quadruple guide as, as close to the um, uh, atoms as possible simply to get uh, uh, large signals. Um, and uh, so this is the, the actual realization. So here's the end cap for the electrodes. Um, here is a, uh, a secondary electron multiplier to detect the electrons from the Rydberg atoms. Um, and also then uh, field coils for the mod and, and some mirrors for, for, for getting the beams and so on. Um, and so, so kind of three uh, key milestones to, to really get this working is, is getting the mod to work, um, successfully getting a uh, Rydberg production and detection and, and then attaching the molecule source. So we've had a mod of, of atoms for uh, just over a year by now. We've also very successfully implemented Rydberg production and detection. So what's shown here is, is again the field ionization, but now for, for uh, ultra cold uh, Rydberg atoms, where um, it's basically the uh, electron signal, so, so they're negatively charged, so the signals are negative, so this is kind of the zero line. Um, and initially you get some electrons because of the laser pulse, uh, just from photo, photo electrons from the laser pulse uh, exciting the Rydberg atoms. And then here in this region, we're applying the field ramp and, and you get a very nice peak from uh, field ionization of the Rydberg atoms. Um, and then the, the, the last big step really to get this to work is attaching the molecules. So this is a picture of the setup from the spring where here's the source of cold molecules. Here's the setup with the magneto optical trap. Um, and uh, just in the last week, we, we now have this attached and it's baked and the mod is working again. So, so it's really, I'm very looking forward to, to, to the next couple of weeks with some uh, probably pretty exciting um, experiments. Um, so, so this gets me to the very last part of my talk, where I just want to give a little bit of an overview of, of where are we kind of heading in, in the more medium term. Um, and, and probably the biggest plan for the immediate future is to add a microwave trap for the molecules. Uh, basically, add a microwave trap uh, combined with the uh, Sisyphus cooling experiment, um, and also to, to superimpose this with a magnetic trap for atoms. Um, and uh, this is kind of a, a rough sketch for what the experiment would look like. So again, we have the velocity filtering source of molecules. We have our electric uh, static trap for initial cooling down to sub-millikelvin temperatures. Um, and then basically using a, a type of guided fountain to, to uh, load the molecules into the microwave trap. Um, and this has several uh, big technical advantages. So a, a, a first very big point is unlike an electrostatic trap, where it's never possible to trap the ground state because the ground state of a particle is always increases the uh, decrease, decreases the energy with applied fields. So they're always going to be high field seeking states, which cannot be trapped in electrostatic fields. Um, but in, in, um, uh, with an AC trap, we can create uh, a field maximum in free space. And, and this allows us to also trap the absolute ground state of the particles. Um, also, the optical access will be dramatically improved, and also uh, it basically allows us to increase uh, density with additional cooling, um, thereby uh, um, uh, entering a collisional dominated regime. Um, and there's really um, uh, three main physics motivations for proceeding in this direction. Uh, the first is really it's, it's a great firm framework for investigating ultra cold collisions and chemistry. 
um, both molecule molecule collisions and as well as atom molecules collision and chemistry. Um, uh, it's, it's still an unanswered question whether a formaldehyde, say formaldehyde rubidium uh, collisions would be exothermic, whether these would take place at, at low temperatures or not. Um, a, a very, very big motivation is to then proceed with further cooling towards quantum degeneracy, um, really uh, enter this really exciting regime of, of uh, many, many body uh, quantum physics. Um, and, and there's really different strategies. One could use sympathetic cooling, evaporative cooling, microwave Sisyphus cooling are, are just some of the options we can explore. And also as a, as a third uh, motivation, it's, it's really an ideal environment to continue investigations of molecule Rydberg atom interactions basically by, by just using the atoms which are present anyway to, to excite these to Rydberg states and, and then to, to uh, investigate interactions in an even more controlled environment. Um, and we're, we're really doing some preliminary work. So this is now our uh, maybe already final microwave resonator. Um, so we have a pair of copper mirrors. Uh, we, I had a, a great master student who spent a year kind of optimizing all aspects of this. So. Uh, Right, the two biggest challenges were, were just investigating different material properties to improve the resonator finesse, as well as coming up with a suitable in-coupling mirror design. So, so it's really a free space in-coupling into the microwave resonator. Um, and, and here is just some data, not from this resonator, but from a similar resonator. We get similar results here, where you can just see you had very narrow resonances. Uh, so it's at a frequency of, of roughly 50 gigahertz. So we have a six millimeter wavelength. So the standing wave nodes would be uh, uh, six millimeters, three millimeters apart, and uh, and and uh, finesse on the order of of uh, one to two thousand. Uh, so so this is really excellent results, which will allow us to achieve uh, trap depths of of just over one millikelvin for the molecules. Um, the second um, uh, direction we're working with in this case on the cryofuge experiment is actually to move towards investigation of chiral molecules. So in particular, we realized fairly recently that there's a, quite a number of, of chiral molecules which are symmetric tops, so typically uh, a C3 symmetry, um, which are ideal for, for using these uh, for the cryofuge experiment. Um, so for example, one molecule uh, which is, is possible is, is a phosphoric acid. So you have a phosphor in the center, you have four oxygen, and then in particular, the OH bond actually give it a a propeller uh, shape to the molecule, thereby making it, it chiral. Um, and here, uh, it, it actually seems really promising to be the first uh, group in this way to, to not only then trap uh, chiral molecules, but also to be able to measure a purity violation in, in these molecules. Um, and, and actually, we also have some pretty, uh, some crazy ideas for how to use uh, chiral molecules for, uh, for uh, quantum information type experiments. Okay, so that brings me to the very end of my talk. I, I just want to uh, thank all the great uh, team members. So um, uh, Manuel Colla, uh, Florian Jung, and uh, Boom Pompao are the current uh, PhD students on the cryofuge experiment. Uh, Isabel Rabi was a postdoc who, who regrettably left us in the spring, um, uh, which is uh, led by uh, Gerd Rempe. Um, the uh, ultra, um, the Sisyphus cooling experiment uh, is, is Maximilian Löw, uh, current PhD student and, and former PhD student Martin Lilbrüger. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank, uh, and as well as uh, Fabian Salomon was the master student who set up the microwave trap. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my former master students, uh, Shreyas Gulhane and Ferdinand Jarisch, um, who worked on the Rydberg experiments um, and finally acknowledged funding by the DFG and, and, and MPQ. And thank you for your attention. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, for this <coughs> beautiful overview of, of kind of the, the ground laying work for for this for this toolbox and the <coughs> and the plethora of applications um, that they enable. Um, we have a bit time for for questions. Um, so, if um, uh, actually, I, I suppose you should just. Uh, raise your hand or something like this, then I can allow you to speak. Um, maybe I, I start with <coughs> with one. Ah, okay. Now Nicolas has a question, so please uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. Um, thanks, Martin, for the talk. It was very nice, very interesting. Um, I, I'm kind of new to this field, so I wanted to ask you a couple of simple questions. Uh, one is um, the, start, the start effect you're talking about is the electric field interaction with a polar molecule, right? That's Correct. what the start effect. Correct. Right. And then when you're talking about start broadening, what you're meaning is that the molecules can be oriented in any dire direction at the given temperature. And then that's why you get different shifts. So I'm missing something. No, no. I, I mean, we're doing the spectroscopy, for example, inside our electric trap. So, so I mean, we have this electric field distribution inside the trap. Mm -hmm. Can you see the screen again? Yeah. yeah. Right, so, so we have this electric field distribution. So, so the molecules are experiencing different electric fields. And I mean, depending on the electric field in which the molecules are present, they're, you know, they're seeing a different frequency or, or they have a different resonant frequency. So this is causing star broadening. But you're saying that the electric field is homogeneous or you mean well, it's, that- it's, it's reasonably homogeneous. I mean, we have a width, uh, relative width on the order of 1%. The half width half maximum is 1%. So they're certainly experiencing a variation on the scale of 1% right in the center, um, but of course also bigger variations towards the edge of the trap. And why the temperature is important for this? The temperature? I mean, the temperature is actually the reason this ends up being temperature dependent. No. Is, is because of Doppler shifts, right? So, so at a at large temperature, we simply, I mean, we, we have the combination of residual stark broadening, which is actually very, very small. The, the really dominant role for broadening is Doppler broadening. Um, Doppler broad, okay, mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so at 60 millikelvin, we, we simply have a line width. I mean, this is you know 30 times the energy, so you get five and a half times the line width just from the velocity of the molecules. Mm -hmm. Then my second question is somehow related. Um, you are saying that you can induce transitions with an RF field. Mm -hmm. um, but I imagine you have some sort of uh, selection rule there. The thing is that I cannot imagine them. Uh, what kind of selection rule there you're, you have to, um, yeah, for example, this one. It's very simple, you delta can... m equal plus minus one selection rule. So you can directly couple neighboring m sublevels with, with dipole transitions. And this is rotating with respect to what axis? Is the, 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 the polar axis of the molecule? The, the electric field axis. The electric field axis, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I think I get an idea. Thank you. Um, so, more questions from the audience? Um, uh, then uh, let me um, let me ask you about the. So you you showed these experiments with kind of particular molecules, how, how universal is the, is the setup? So can you basically uh, to decide to use now different molecules or is, do you have to go through kind of all the same uh, engineering uh, uh, complications uh, for, each, uh, for each one that you would like to trap or investigate? So, so this initial setup we had here is actually extremely generic. Um, because we were, I mean, the source, you can just attach different molecule sources here. And then we ended up detecting the molecules with the quadruple mass spectrometer. Um, and, and, and basically just by tuning the mass you're looking at with the QMS, you can uh, uh, change molecule species. Um, I mean, the, the experiment becomes specific in, in, in several regards. One is, is, I mean, for the cooling experiments, we are driving transitions with a laser with, with millimeter wave transitions. And, and these are molecule specific. And also we actually, for this experiment in the last couple of years, we also detected a, a, a detection specific to formaldehyde um, using light induced fluorescence. And, and there were driving transitions at around 350 nanometers, which are also specific to, to uh, formaldehyde. And, 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 and so in that sense, a changing would also require some work. Um, at the moment, really the, the Sisyphus cooling experiment, which, which mostly still looks like this, except for the change detection, um, is really geared quite heavily towards formaldehyde. Um, in contrast, the, the cryofuge experiment is, is really still completely generic. Um, and I mean, what's also really powerful here is um, a, a key challenge is, um, 
I mean, if you really want to do experiments with molecules in specific quantum states, then the fact that at, at larger temperatures, you know, uh, just in a huge number, so, so even a molecule like the tree propine, uh, this molecule here, you, you have on the order of a million different states, internal states populated at room temperature. Mm -hmm. And so here having uh, the cryogenic buffer gas source to initially cool the internal degrees of freedom is just a huge, really essential benefit to do any kind of uh, state selected physics with these types of molecules. Um, and, and, and that's certainly also reason, I mean, the fact that quite possibly um, we can simply now switch to a chiral molecule species by simply switching the source and, and switching the, uh, the, the, the detector um, really shows the power of this method. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, I see no further questions. Um, if there are none, then I think let's uh, let's thank Martin for his talk. He'll be around uh, still to the, this afternoon and tomorrow. So if uh, anybody's interested in talking to him, please uh, send me a note. We can set up a meeting. And um, yeah, thanks for joining. Thanks, Martin, for speaking. And um, thank you. Uh, goodbye.